across Ontario. So not just clubs uh, and administrators, but just trying to get a feel for, for the other organizations regarding how they feel, how people feel about returning to play this summer. Um, if they have specific um, restrictions they'd like to see in place. And, and so I definitely, I get the appetite that there's, they, the, certainly the seasons haven't been given up on. They'll definitely be modified in terms of start dates. Um, they may be compressed in terms of, in terms of trying to uh, play multiple games in a week, or maybe they'll look at weekend schedules. I know the grassroots probably is all going to be Saturdays from yeah. you, which uh, over here is U9 to U12. So yeah. the United 12 leagues are all going to be on Saturdays from what I understand, uh, which leaves the fields wide open for the, the older groups to go through the week. Um, but definitely the the districts and the regions are looking at compressed schedules right now where, and, and, running into October potentially. So some of the cups, the league, the end of season cups would not run, but uh, they are definitely intent on getting seasons in there and, and trying to get as many games as possible. So there seems to be an appetite to play. It's just a matter of when everything will be in control. Uh, Ontario, so um, we have uh, a case count every day they announced for each province and how many cases of uh, new cases of COVID. So yesterday we spiked back up. So we, we tend to be between 350 and 500 um, cases a, new cases a day. Um, there's a lot more testing than there was three weeks ago, but, but um, we've hit a plateau, but we haven't started the decline yet. So, so there's definitely a little bit of concern. Um, Ontario's starting to reopen this week. So like hardware stores today will reopen for the first time that you can go in. Um, next week retail businesses begin opening cur for curbside delivery so you can't go into the retail business but you can call ahead you can um, i guess go to the, the shop on broadway or on the front street and ask for um, product and they can bring it out so so they're trying to do a staggered reopen it's like the first phase um parks are being reopened so those are those are some of the uh, big changes here but we're still um our professional sports organizations are allowed to begin opening their facilities for training. Um, and as long as they have some, some measures in place to control or restrict uh, movements. So, or, or the number of people in a room. So that began, uh, that begins this week too. So the, the local sports organizations um, in hockey and soccer and, and uh, basketball are, are looking at how they, they begin that up. So basketball is the first to announce how they'll do it. And in Ontario, the Raptors are going to restrict movement to one person per, at a time or one athlete at a time is allowed in the facility to practice and one coach. So they're <laughs> still, they're still, minute, yeah. Yeah. So they'll have shoot arounds. They're going to have a big schedule of when everybody can, can do their shooting and whatnot and practicing. So, so it's yeah. definitely, um, it's definitely a staggered method. Um, it, it's, it's a long way, I think, before we get games yet, but. I mean, I say a long way. We could be in July when we start our seasons up. So that's kind of our hopeful target, I think. Awesome. So before we continue going any going forward, uh, forward guys, uh, thanks for uh, joining in and coming in on our soccer talk. I think this is fantastic. This is something that we would do on a regular, but in the company of Boston Pizza or something else. So I think this is uh, I think this is awesome. Uh, we have, a, we, have a, we have a new guest. We have a new guest, and uh, Tom, you can go ahead and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, thanks for letting me join the uh, chat. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, cheers, Lou. <laughs> so yeah, my name's Tom. Um, currently working for Aston Villa Foundation. So my primary role there is um, a school sports coach to work in in primary schools. I'm not sure what. It's not called primary schools, is it, in uh, Canada? Um, what would it be called here, Chris? The elementary. Yeah, yeah. elementary. Yeah. 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 Nice, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Bit of Simpsons. <laughs> so, yeah, um, started doing that. Been full-time um, really all of this year. But, um, and then that, that's my full-time job. And then with... Uh, another part-time job on top of that with Aston Villa. I'm working within the girls' uh, regional talent club, so it's like equivalent to their academy, and that's um, had some really big changes recently. And it's got cool. It's coming to. It's going to be a nice big project where they're going to have their own academy system. So it's something to really look look out for. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Neil. 
what tier are they Tom? Because there's tiers, isn't it, of uh, regional? Yes. So it's, I think it's tier three at the moment, but right. we're looking to get to tier one. Right. Based up. <clears throat> so we've had Chrissy come in, if you know Chrissy. No. Uh, no. no. I, I, we're all good on that. But uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get talking on that for sure. That's, uh, I'd like to uh, pick your brain on that in terms of what's happening uh, overseas for sure. Because uh, here, uh, I'll start off with one of our academies here, because um, we have many academies here. Uh, people are opening up academies left, right, and center. But one of the academies over here that's gone belly up, gone bankrupt, is uh, the Barcelona Academy. So the Barcelona Academy across Canada has completely shut down, closed doors, um, no money, not re uh, no refunds to parents, and they just shut shut the door. And we're talking like uh, uh, there was they had a quite a bit of uh, um, athletes like participants there. So it's pretty crazy, you know what I mean? What this uh, COVID's been doing, uh, it just shut them down. I know my daughter uh, currently plays for Athletes Institute. You know what I mean? So but she's had, we've, we've taken her to camps through Barcelona there. Um, I have to say that the, the, the structure and everything was fantastic. I thought it was great. Uh, and uh, I think, um, yeah, the, the, the structure was great. The, the technical director at the time there for uh, Barcelona was, uh, was, it, was, it, was, a, was a great individual. He, he knew his stuff really well. And yeah, um, we just have, uh, thank you, Maria, for joining. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Hi, hi, everybody. Sorry, I was just wrapping up. Uh, I was just wrapping up another call there. So, hi, everybody. How are you? Good, good, good. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining. We're just talking about right now. We're just jumping in, uh, and uh, we're talking about the, the Barcelona Academy the one that's just gone uh, uh, went bankrupt, and uh, just uh, our, our thoughts and views from that uh, in regards to COVID. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's just been it's been crazy. So. Uh, I've talked to some parents that have been involved in that and um, their kids, um, they're, they're definitely upset. They, it's something that they, they didn't foresee, but um, now it's just a lot of players and coaches and stuff like that that are, are going to be looking elsewhere. So uh, what's your take on that, Chris? What do you think? Um, it definitely, it's the, the feedback on uh, like some of the social media um, has actually been, almost empathetic towards the coaches and the people. So echoing what you said a couple minutes ago or a couple seconds ago is that um, the camps, the organization was pretty top rate. Um, the coaches were, were well thought of. Um, there's a lot of sympathy for them having lost their positions. Um, the feeling is that the camp was quality, but, um, but uh, definitely there's some upset because right up until a couple weeks ago, they were still taking the, uh, they were still taking fees so some people had paid their 950 for camps and whatnot. And there's a few people that have multiple, multiple kids that are owed a few thousand dollars that pretty sure they're not going to see that. But um, yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate. It's, it certainly, um, it certainly makes you concerned for, for the academies, especially if they don't have a, a group uh, or if they haven't had a, a large um, mem membership to help pay for uh, or, or build a base. There are some new academies. They don't have much funding. I guess if they don't have overhead costs, it might be easier to swallow. Um, I mean, all their coaches are probably furloughed right now, but the, uh, if you have building space or you have leases that you've already paid, um, then it becomes uh, probably a lot more dire um, if you're not getting back out very shortly and you, you can't collect your fees. And so I think clubs, some of those not-for-profit clubs may be in a better state right now just because they have such a base of membership that uh, they've had uh, incomes coming in over time and, and um, if they don't have leases or, or buildings that they have to worry about, then they're probably in okay shape. I know from uh, our standpoint from Storm FC, we're okay right now. Um, we'll definitely operate at a loss for the year if we don't have, uh, even right now, you know, if we start our season up in, in July, I'm not sure we'll see the same numbers. Um, we're down several hundred members right now from where we are at this time. Usually on May 9th, um, our, our registration is closed and we're, we've built the teams and our season's going to start the weekend after May 2, 4. So we're, um, we'd be kicking it in high gear. Um, and we're about 300 memberships below that right now for outdoor. Um, the season doesn't go, then, then that's obviously a lot of refunds going out. Um, and, and so it's, it's definitely, we would operate as, at a loss 
for sure for the season. And that's, uh, you know, you don't want to have too many seasons where you have losses because it becomes uh, financially, um, you struggle and, and you can be in jeopardy. We'll be okay this year, but, but um, I, the smaller clubs, I really worry about them because I think they're, they're really going to struggle, especially some of the academies. Yeah, I think we've got that in England at the minute. There's, there's loads of grassroots clubs that are, that are going to struggle. I was reading an article in the Garden newspaper the other day about some uh, some clubs. It costs them like thirty thousand pounds a year just for the facilities that they're going to hire. And at the minute, they're not getting uh, training fees, subscription fees, and, um, and, and <clears throat> raising in for the club. So that so they're really struggling. Um, I know the local league around where we are now, the grassroots league. They've actually come out and said that they're not um, they're not doing. Um, entry fees for this next league coming in just to try and help the clubs which is something hopefully that, that a lot of leagues can do but the costs are high aren't they for uh, and there's, there's no money coming in for these grassroots clubs and unfortunately there's no one to, to subsidize them in these times unfortunately what do you uh, i was going to ask uh, so maria um what do you think on what do you think on that with in terms of uh, barcelona and stuff like that you know like um I just wanted to throw out there, you've done a fantastic job with, uh, um, with what you do online. It's great. Uh, anytime I can join in, uh, I can, because uh, sometimes I'm at work. So um, uh, I try and join in with my ear pods or my, my Galaxy Buzz trying to listen in. And I can get a couple of snippets because you have uh, some fantastic guests in terms of the Division One coaches and stuff. But then there's times where, my, unfortunately, my boss, because everyone has a boss, comes around the corner. I'll just be like, yeah, I'm not stuck. I'm stuck. <laughs> so uh, what's your take on all this on the – what's happening with Barcelona and uh, maybe future academies and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So first, thanks for the, the uh, you know, shout out there. But I think it's tough. I think, um, I think Ontario Soccer now is doing a good job at, at um, saying for clubs and academies that kind of want status, that they've put that on hold. I think they need to do a better job at, at making sure and kind of going through the financials of these little academies or clubs that, you know, want to open and, and make sure that they have enough teams you know, to support it. So I know that's times new for, for everyone, but it's sad reading, reading about it and, you know, how many people are now in, you know, some financial, you know, troubles that they've paid for summer camps or they paid for the March break camp was big. Some of them have paid to go to Barcelona for the summer to play in that, that annual uh, little tournament that they do. Plus their fees are, are pretty expensive. And plus I think too, the, a lot of people had to adjust the training because the training there is early. Like some of the training starting off four o'clock, five o'clock. So parents have made this huge jump. So I, ju- I knew it was going to happen because I knew they had let go a couple of coaches and coaches sent a couple of emails to the members, you know, to kind of say how disappointed they were with the, with being let go the way they were. Um, and then, you know, just kind of that announcement. So it doesn't really set a, um, I know Ontario soccer sometimes doesn't have the best rep and, and it's not, and it's not from, it's not from the members or, or the people it's from these little fake accounts that are unhappy, but never voice their opinion. Right. Um, so, you know, these fake accounts pop up everywhere. They go at Ontario soccer, but they're not helping the, the solution and, and we need them to speak out and, and speak on, on this. So I think this will be a turning point for, for you know the province to start to really vet these these academies, you know I've been in part of part of academies before, um, and it's tough, right? You're competing against um, you know you, you, players come and go. Now they don't have a base of house these players, so it's tough to pull players and kind of get players into your rep program if you're not having them come out at trials. So you look at academies. No academy has from eight to eighteen on boys, both the girls and boys side. Um, So it's hard to, you know, keep things going. You might have three or four teams or one or two teams that are great, but no one really has. Like it used to be U8 to U18, boys and girls, one or two teams, because it's so easy to open a club or academy. So I think we need to do a better job at just kind of vetting those those places. It's a very, very tough thing. You know, I read from one of the coaches. um, I'm sure if you guys are on Twitter, you know, he wrote that, I think like 20 different tweets about his experience as a coach at Barcelona. It was tough to read because he gave up a lot. I think driving from Kitchener into Mississauga to coach every day. So yeah, I feel I feel for for them. Um, but I think it's a wake up call for for our province now to kind of look at what to do next to vet these these clubs and academies. 
Sorry, Mary, is there some sort of um, club licensing or infrastructure in place for these sort of academies? There is now. We're just a lot of clubs and academies are now going through the club licensing, so to be tiered, um, mm. which is great. Uh, and now they're kind of saying any new clubs and academies that kind of want status in order to play in official leagues have to wait till 2021. Um, so, but Barcelona ch checked all the boxes, so it was kind of just out of the blue that that it happened. Um, so, but there's way too many. I mean. I think they said Peel Halton, so a region in, in Ontario, I think has the most clubs and academies per region in all of Ontario. Like wow. there's something like, I think there's like 18 or 19 in, in one area. So, and then you look in like, um, you know, where I grew up in, in York region, at one time you had like eight, per, like OPDL, so the highest level of clubs within 20 minutes of each other. So it, it's not filtering the best players because it's too spread out. Right. So um, I think we'll eventually get there, but yeah, it, it's tough. And, you know, being, being here, one player's here at one club, one year, one year, and then next year they're there. And by, by U10, they play for four or five clubs. Mm -hmm. So that's something that, that we need to change in order to make sure we have eyes on the right players. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree on that. Uh, I find that uh, what happens is if you have too many, then what ha you water down the system, you know what I mean? So people just basically go from one club to another and then uh, they bounce around and you don't have any consistency, right? So I think that going forward, yeah, the structure definitely has to change. Um, I think that um, um, a lot of coaches and uh, people that are in Ontario soccer and academies and stuff like that, um, I, I, we all see that. I just think that we have to take uh, the initiative to, to get it going, right? Because uh, exactly, good point. You have so many different OPDL teams that are 10, 15 minutes away. And uh, from the smallest thing, a parent may not like the way your dress attire is. It has nothing to do with soccer. It has nothing to do with um, – they have they, they, they've painted this picture in their head of what a soccer coach or a soccer academy is. And, and for that split moment or for, for the three sessions that they're at, uh, they don't see it. They, they don't believe in it and they're gone. So there's a lot of, uh, it's kind of weak on that. So I wanted to touch base on uh, uh, with you, Lewis, as well, and Tom uh, and, and Neil. Um, how does it work over there? Like, um, do you guys have in your area? I know that soccer is a whole different, like we talked before, in terms of the, the passion there is amazing, right? But how does it work over there in terms of your academy uh, status and stuff? Do, is there rules, restrictions in terms of where academies open up or – do they follow something uh, similar? I'm happy to let Neil go first, though. Uh, I'll, I'll, if, if you want to, and I'll discuss my opinions afterwards. Go for it, Lewis. Yeah, yeah, go first, yeah. mate. Yeah. No worries. Um, so, in regards to the to the, the Welsh Women's League, um, at the moment, we've just received our Tier 1 um, licensing agreement, um, which many of the clubs previous to us have applied for and, and got accepted for. Now, I'm writing a thesis at the moment on uh, sustaining uh, women's football in Wales and, and how we can do that with club infrastructure and all that stuff. So the, the club licensing is great for myself to have a little look at. But within that club licensing, we, we are an amateur club um, and the club licensing wants us to have stuff like uh, physios and doctors, uh, media officers, a first team manager, an assistant manager. Um, uh, and for us as an amateur club, uh, looking to get to the top tier of women's football in Wales, it's difficult because, you know, like physios in Wales are like gold dust. You, you know, if you get one, you've got to keep them and you've got to do as much as you can to keep them. Um, in regards to facilities, a lot of the facilities are rented. So they've got criteria on stadia. Um, and for me, in regards to the, the governing body of Wales, which is the FAW, um, I think it's a great, it's a great direction that they're going in. But to do it so soon, I think it's quite a big jump for clubs to go from here to here. Um, if they sort of put this out in stages and they were looking for things season by season, can you get this, this, this and this? I think it would be more sustainable and doable. But asking, asking clubs to get, you know, media officers and, and, you know, whereas we've got small budgets and our budgets mainly go on facilities and, and, and coaching equipment and, and playing equipment. Um, you know, it's quite difficult to, to bring these people in and the lists as well. You know, you've got to sort of beg, borrow and steal where you can and, and, and really, really, really 
um, put across your goals and your visions to to these types of people who maybe get turned by the professional academies around here. Uh, you like of Cardiff City, uh, Swansea City, Newport County, all those all those clubs and academies you're fighting against for these volunteers or or decent coaches. Um, but to, in regards to academies, it's it's for women's football for me difficult because there's such a I think there's such a small player base in South Wales. Um, you've got you've got a large number of academies, but they're not sustainable. They're not able to sustain the girls because they sort of lose interest. Um, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 onwards. Um, so at the moment, they are introducing lots of um, initiatives such as the, the huddle play, which is just, it's just go and play, um, go and have fun. Um, and what they do is sort of they deliver sessions and if they enjoy them, then put, the, put them into these sister clubs um, that are around the area of this huddle club, um, which is a great idea. Um, and we're not going to bear the fruits of those ideas from the FAW Trust for maybe five to ten years um, but we are really really trying in Wales to improve women's football um, but from from my point of view at, at the adult senior level I think it's just a little bit too much of a step up for us at the moment. I think um, sort of to answer your question about academies and how how and where they can set up I think basically in England just wherever and whenever people want to really that's the as you say the, the passion for people with the with the with the football is is unbelievable. So we see a lot now. There's a lot more academies or development centres, however way you want to call it, is they they're getting set up because people are getting government funding for sort of college courses. So you're getting a lot of academies propping up everywhere that are 16s to 18s that are independently run or they run in conjunction with colleges. Then at the younger ages, you've got basically anyone could set up their own academy system. So. Um, for any players that aren't in sort of the Cat Three, Cat Two, and Cat One academies, what what are your thoughts, Neil, on the on the private academies being set up by non non clubs? Um, it's difficult. I think um, some some are well intentioned, so some have yeah. got the intentions of of you know bridging that gap between sort of grassroots and an academy, so they're giving the players extra training, so they've got the grassroots so they, where they can go and enjoy themselves and try and win trophies but then extra sessions in these academy development centres to hopefully improve themselves and then go on to professional clubs. But then you've got other uh, development centres, academies, as you well know, Lewis, that are probably just doing it just for the money and just trying to get bodies in. And almost yeah. probably kids that, yeah, if you come in with us, we'll get you somewhere when they're probably not up to the standard. So they'll, they're just looking for numbers and, 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 and money through the door type thing. So that's why I think the restrictions are difficult, Christos, because I think, um, there should be restrictions but how you're restricted I don't know um, how do you pick the ones who are well intentioned and the ones who aren't I don't know we've just had a player who, um, well, a former player at Morecambe who's set one up over the last sort of 18 months um, to be fair to him his is, is well intentioned and it's, uh, his is very much on, along the lines of um, the players there going there to enjoy themselves boy girls going to enjoy the, the football um, and then the, if they can help them Onto a, onto a club or to trial at a club, then they'll do that. So I think it's a lot more relaxed atmosphere that he does, and he does it really, really well. We've got a little bit of a link with him through our academy. We play a few games, so we play games against sort of their older age groups uh, to give our sort of younger players or smaller players a little bit more of a test. But if it works like that, it works quite well. But as I say, Lewis, Lewis, you you know as well as I do that some are just there, just thinking, kind of make that extra buck. There's there there isn't any sort of. Um licensing or vetting is there with with private academies compared to professional academies of the categories there's nothing in place for these private academies to to sort well, of no, set yeah, these there's standards no, yeah there's no legislation so there's no specifics in what you do have to have and and don't have to have i suppose you know the academies have to have your physios and and, and all your different people in place and but they'll still have to have the uh, coach player ratios and they'll still have to have first aid training as well, just as part yeah. of the safeguarding. So that, on a basic level, I guess there is sort of legislation for them, but it's nowhere near as um, looked at as, as proper academies. And I think that's where people have to be a little bit wary of them, really, to send, send the kids there. And, and again, they're paying money, so you need to pay 
for what you want to get out of it, really. So if your kid's going to go there and enjoy himself and you're paying, you're happy to pay. So he gets an extra two training sessions a week and that's what it's for. Fantastic. If it's there to push him onto a, a professional academy and the intentions of that development centre or academy aren't there, then, then you waste any money. But it is, yeah, it is difficult. And it's difficult because, as you say, they can come up anywhere, anywhere they want within the country. Yeah. What about you, Tom? What's your thoughts? Well, I mean, I haven't really had too much to, to do with like external uh, academies, but I think you've got to be careful with them and what they are providing. I'm sure most have got good intentions, but I think I do agree with Neil in the sense of some probably are just after the money more so, but luckily I probably don't have to deal with that too much. I've just got to focus on <laughs> the, the, the kids that I've got and just make sure I'm ticking the correct boxes. Uh, from what I'm doing, but yeah. What um, what would uh, just a general cost? Okay, we don't have to go into specifics, but in academies in say in Europe, what what are, what do the costs look like uh, there versus here? Like I know here, uh, you you get you get academy costs anywhere from yearly from depending on what what services you get, of course. But you're looking at anywhere between twenty five hundred. Uh, uh, low end all the way up to I've seen academies where it's 5,500, 5,800 a year. You know what I mean? So what does it look like for you guys over there? Like what, what's, what's a lot of money? What's uh, like for clubs, it's all different, right? So for here, nonprofit organizations, you can look at uh, uh, what would you say, Chris, indoor fees would be say, or say outdoor, just in general, just the uh, number. Well, a lot of not-for-profit clubs are for, for travel soccer. Um, are probably between like 800, 750 is like a low end, all the way to 1500 for the not-for-profit clubs. Um, but if you're getting in the academies, and that, that's for your, that really is just for the, the summertime. Um, because then if they participate in the indoor leagues, a lot of the kids end up paying another 250 to $400 for the indoor session um, when it comes to being involved in the leagues, that's per player. Because uh, the indoor league expenses are obviously a lot higher with uh, for facility rental time. For academies, though, yeah, you'll see you'll see twenty five hundred bucks uh, a season almost on some of them. Um, it's probably a, a, probably an average, and then and then you've got the OPDLs another another layer too, right? Where some places like out in Ottawa can can do it for like fifteen hundred bucks, um, and then again goes all the way up and depends on what I guess it depends on what they're offering. It's really how often the coach is out and how often. What are the standards, right? So it's really, it's, it's definitely not controlled. There's no, um, there is no recommendation from a governing body in terms of what you charge. It really is depending on the area you're in um, and what you're looking for. So if you're looking for club soccer with coaches that have done some base level training and then you're going to get, uh, you'll have the lower end sticker fee. And if you want to get up into more advanced training, it, it does go up very quickly. How about you guys? That, that sounds expensive to me. I don't know about you, Lewis, and Tom. <laughs> yes. Um, before before we were an academy, uh, we ran a development centre before we got Cat 3 status. So uh, we were charging the kids. We were we had them on a Friday night, so they'd have a two-hour session on a Friday um, and a game every other Wednesday. So effectively, what what's that? Ooh, something like... Let me work it out. It's, a, it's, a, it's around about sort of what ten, twelve hours worth of, of football per month, and they were we were only charging them thirty pound a month. So what's that's around about five hundred. Oh. So again, that's from a, a, a professional club uh, development centre. I would say again, I, I'm guessing now because it, it we're we'll, we'll going about sort of four years later now. I'm guessing it's not a great deal different what these development centres academies are charging. Tom Lewis, what do you think? Um, I'm not sure if I'm getting this wrong, Tom, but when we were at Newport, um, I think it was only the, the, the pre-academy that was charging, wasn't it? And I think it was under nines up when it came into the EPPP. Were we not, were we not charging then? Was it I'm EFL not, funded? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I know that the pre-academy was, you had to pay for that. How much is that? Well, I don't know. I can't remember now. To be honest, it's a long time ago. <laughs> um, I would have thought probably a few hundred at least. 
Yeah, I think, I think, I think re- recently Newport County, I think it was in 2018, they gained Cat 3 status, which I went from, like what you said, Neil, you went from Cat 4 to Cat 3, where it was sort of regarded as a development centre into professional academy. Um, but at, at, um, at under nines, um, I don't think we were charging. I think under nines up, I think it was classed as EFL funded. And uh, maybe that was over the first few years, I'm not sure, of getting Cat, cat 3 status. I, I, I really don't know. But um, from, from Tom's point of view, Tom was in the... I've just had a look at ours now, Lewis. Uh, we still run a development centre now as well. So yeah. uh, um, kind of bridging the gap between grassroots and the academy itself. So it's an under it's under six to under twelve, so sort of pre-academy up until twelves. Yeah. And um, the price for ours, so they do a two hour session uh, an hour and a half session on a Wednesday, and yeah. then the better players are then invited to another session on the Thursday. So not all the players, so they're all still paying the same amount, but uh, they they pay forty pounds for an eight week block. <laughs> 40 so, pounds for an eight-week block. <laughs> eight-week block, yeah. Wow, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one problem we have here too is not just your club fees. You then pay for recruiting service, video service, travel. Um, you know, if you do extra training on the side, um, strength and conditioning. So it's all like plus, 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 plus fees and your clubs don't have those fees or those services provided inside. So yes, you pay a lot for like a base fee here. And then most players, if they want to be a lead or go to the next level, have to pay for extra trainers, um, a recruiter, someone to take their video and do highlights, uh, strength and conditioning people. So it's wow. all plus, plus, plus. Some of the bills, like, you know, I, I talk to people all the time, <laughs> seven, 8,000, like you're looking at at the end of it. Um, you know, plus travel, plus going down and, and visiting schools or anything or like going on, on trials, like this, it all adds up. So because, you know, sometimes clubs don't provide those services to those players to do extra or have like strength and conditioning in there. So if players want it, they have to seek it elsewhere. So, um, yeah, and, and, our, and, our, and our football, like you're not going four or five nights a week. Some of these programs are only three nights a week. So you know, you might see your kids six hours a, a week um, compared to when you come over to Europe, you know, you're with them up to, you know, 10 to 14. So you're paying more for, for less here, which is, is, is crazy. And, you know, I've talked to, I've been to Europe so many times, you know, I was living and coaching there. It's, just, it's crazy when you come back here to, to see. As, as a coach, if you want to be a full-time coach here, you can um, because the wage is, is pretty good on salary. But yeah, for parents and and everybody they they struggle and it wasn't like this when when I was growing up these fees it oh. wasn't, wasn't this it wasn't like this like I don't know when it happened but it just <laughs> happened and and now it just keeps going up. I think with ours, I think um, we've used it more as a as a scouting tool as a trialing tool. So we're not that interested in the money. So we're as long as the money covers the hire of of the venue and and the coaches. Uh, wages for, for that night or for the nights they're working then for us it's more about just getting the kids in who've got that potential who might be looking to to join the academy in the future so i think to entice them certainly in our area if you charge them too much you might be losing some of the better players because uh without being funny again I, I, lewis and tom you might find this yeah. but the rough around the edges players who are from maybe the rougher areas tend, tend to be the better players so if you charge too much um, oh, you're alien, and you're isolating those types of players as well and you want to try and encourage those so that's where um, I think the less money um, that we charge helps I mean if you do if you were going to do it as a as a money making scheme then you would charge a lot more and I'm sure you would get players in but they wouldn't be up to the standard that we'd want I think I think that is the difference isn't it like you said Maria over in, in Canada and Christos and Chris I think it is more of a money maker it, you're out there for the money more than the development of the player whereas I think obviously our our ideology and culture over here is developing the player first I suppose and like you said you know just covering the costs um, but um, in, in our experience me and Tom at Newport County I think we had what was it per week Tom was it six hours a week plus game uh, game days or plus pre uh, the EFL program six that be it was two training sessions which were two hours long each and then the games you're looking at six hours a week wasn't it 
Yeah, and I mean, from from my point of view, ourselves, I think, you know, we'd all like to say we'd like to be with our with our with our teams and our kids, uh, you know, a lot longer than that. But um, I think that's all we could provide under the EFL EFL and the funding that we had. Um, but it, what we sort of provided on the side was um, like uh, sort of ETC training sessions where the better <coughs> kids, like you said, Neil, would go to the go to these training sessions. But this is within the professional academy uh, sphere, and then they would play against like U10, U11, U12. Um, so we, we we did provide that as well, but um, it is it is a little bit crazy how how we sort of provide all that, and, and we still get some parents complaining and moaning. And, and uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> here. every single parent will. <laughs> we get probably agree on that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. definitely, definitely on our end over here too. Yeah, for parents, I think uh, I think that goes across the board. Uh, you're going to have great parents. You're going to have parents that just don't see it. And um, you just got to keep track. And I remember when I first started coaching, uh, it would uh, personally bother me in terms of uh, what was happening. But now it's a point where you, you've got, uh, when you get experience and stuff like that, when you believe in what you do and uh, when you're confident behind in what you do, then you, you stick through it. You keep doing it. You know what I mean? And no matter what, no matter what you do, you're going to have uh, parents and, and, and they'll see it they'll believe in it and they won't believe in it right as long as your your key focus like for myself and coaching is developing players you know i mean making sure that uh, i take the time to to identify where the player needs to get developed and continue going forward right and that's the thing so yeah going back to academies and stuff like that i know when i played in europe it was different than than playing over here um, um you would i would get compensated a little bit um but the fees, there wasn't any fees. I was basically brought in um, to play um, at a higher level there, but yeah, it wasn't, uh, it was nothing like over here. Um, so it's, it's hard, especially when we're trying to roll out costs and stuff like that. And then uh, you're trying to tell parents and come across, they, they look at you and you're just like, uh, yeah, the, the cost is X amount and uh, they're, they're giving you this blank look at uh, blank stare and you're just like, yeah, we can offer this, 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 this. And then, oh, but we can also do this and we add on this. And then exactly like you were saying, Maria, it was just <laughs> in your head, subconsciously, you're thinking going, holy smokes. But in reality, you're just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, this is what we do. And, and you go forward, right? So Yeah. And no, just like you said, and, and it, it's literally like a, a like a door-to-door -door salesman sometimes <laughs> with parents to convince them to come to your program and you know what your program has to the person five minutes down the road um and it's it's always like that like it, some people get so like wrapped up in 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 having kids like i was working for a club um this is a couple years back and we were running an event on a field and another club came and put a flyer in everyone's car for their like imagine like you know like it's just it's crazy <laughs> it's crazy how how it is here but it, it happens right and and uh kids go and and come and you know it's just it, it's a constant merry-go-round and it's, it's selling your program sometimes um and then a lot of people here it's it, it's big in some some clubs and, and academies that they over promise and under deliver on on what they're going to say so um, and then they don't get called out for it, right? So I think that's something we need to do a better job at um, and calling these people out and, 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 yeah, to make our programs better. But, yeah, no, just like you said, Grizzles, it's, it's, it's interesting here. Oh, well, it's, um, it's, 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 it's um, with, um, I guess if you're, if you are charging and charging a lot of money, uh, that's get, I would imagine that's when you get probably more problems from parents because if I'm paying out this money as a parent I'm expecting the product I'm expecting this to be high quality I mean exactly yeah but you have to that's what we're lucky to have enough fantastic parents to be fair now because again they're they're almost uh, looking to please us all the time because they're not paying money for a start they want us to make good decisions about the kids yeah so our parents are generally fantastic um only when you know you say no to the kids then generally there are problems but I would imagine if you're paying upwards of five six seven thousand dollars a year then again you're gonna have people going listen i'm not happy with this <laughs> if well the are thing is the 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 what i find is this if you're if you're first of all if you're charging money in anything you do yeah you're gonna have to see some kind of results or development 100 percent. okay but the thing is this what i've told parents in the past is what does your son and your daughter 
do outside of the field? Like, what do you do outside from your practices? You know what I mean? Is it just, I come to the practices and I'm, I'm to take your player to the next level. Yes. I'm going to do everything I can within the time I have, but what does your son or daughter do afterwards? You know what I mean? Are they passionate about it? Are they watching videos? Half the time, I'll, I'll, if, uh, I guarantee you right now, go to 20, 30 players anywhere, clubs, academies, and say, name me, I don't know, if it's a boys team, name me three or four players off the national team. They'll look at you with deer cotton headlights, okay? Uh, name me three or four players off the national team, the women's team, okay? Uh, what's the new MLS expansion draft? What's, so if you don't have these questions and stuff that you follow, how do you expect your son or daughter to get to that next level? You know what I mean? So on this panel that we're all talking here, we're all passionate about the sport. We follow it. You know what I mean? We can't wait. Like for myself, uh, Lewis, we were just talking about earlier, Bundesliga starting next week. Can't wait. Can't wait to start off. Can't wait to watch it. I'm watching. Uh, uh, I was no. doing cardio. I was doing, car I was doing cardio in my basement. And I'm watching. Uh, I'm looking at Netflix so I don't get too bored doing cardio. And I'm watching uh, Match Day, uh, Barcelona Match Day on Netflix. I'm like, oh, cool. So these are things that you watch even as a coach or as a player, but you, you engulf yourself into it. So when you tend to do that, I believe eventually, guess what? You're going you're gonna to get into the right pathway of meeting the right people. But if you're just there, oh, my money, I'm paying X amount of money, you have to take my son or my daughter to this. No, I don't have to do any of it. Right now, this is the norm. This is what happens around where we're at. You have to do a, a lot more than just pay the, pay the money, right? I know the fees are, are, are high in certain areas, like for academies. But I think exactly going back to your point there, uh, um, Neil, it's the, the money when they pay, the expectations behind it. And it, 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 I see it, right? I see that. But way, the way I turn it around back is basically what does your son and daughter do beyond that? You know what I mean? Do you go to – do you do combines? Do you do uh, uh, camps? Do you go do all these things, right? So do you try and get to every avenue as best as you can? Or is it just – I'm putting all my eggs in this basket here and then uh, I'm shooting for the stars, right? So, I don't know, Maria. Self-motivation like, uh, back to again, aren't we, Christos? Hey, say that again? Self-motivation we're back to again, then, aren't we? Yeah. 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 Which, is, which has got to be in the player. I think, I think we're quite lucky over here in, in Wales and England that obviously we're governing body funded. Uh, Neil, you know, yourself and Morecambe, uh, if I'm wrong, you know, um, and we were funded in Newport and that sort of, that, that monetary pressure is, is taking off us and we can, you know, we can then deliver the best of the best coaching we can. And, and, you know, money isn't an issue. You know, it's, it's what you're going to do for my kid now. Uh, what, what can they do for you? You know, what can mum and dad do to get the child there to train in earlier, quicker? What can they do? And I mean, I'm not sure, you know, I'm sure Tom's experienced that as well with his girls and, and at Newport with myself, but I've had parents saying, um, do you do one-to-one -one training sessions? Um, and obviously contracted, we, we can't deliver that. You know, we're, it's not within our contract. We're not, you know, we're not allowed to get any monetary um, for, for doing one-to-ones, but we've had parents saying, uh, what can we do? Can we watch games? Can we, um, can we go and take them to the, to the park and play with them? And we're like, yeah, you know, let them do as much as they can individually at home in a park with, with brother, sister, whoever. Um, and, and to be fair, you know, there's a lot of them that do want to go that extra mile. Um, because I think they see the, the lights of the Premier League and all that, or, or, you know, for their kid to get to the, to the best level possible. Question for you. Um, uh, actually, I was going to ask you, Maria, um, regarding, um, I guess, clubs and academies, um, for players that, you, again, I, I got to send kudos. You do an excellent job in terms of the development, in terms with players, uh, fantastic work. What do you tell parents? What do you tell athletes where they want to go? Because playing at a higher level, okay, you got, you, we all have goals and dreams, but you can't start and your main focus is, okay, I'm going to become the best player in the world if we don't do the small steps in between, right? So what, what's your take on that, buddy? Yeah, so, uh, you know, and, and thank you, Crystals, because I know you send some of your girls to, to me to do training, so I do private training here in, in the city, um, and sometimes I feel more, more of a therapist than a one-on-one -on -one coach, because it's their time to unleash on me how bad their club is and, you know, what they're doing wrong, um, and because I'm not affiliated um, with, with clubs anymore and, and academies as of right now, um, you know, I just kind of sit back and I have to listen, but it's always the same thing. 
uh, I'm not getting playing time. We're not traveling. Um, this girl's playing when she shouldn't be, or this boy's playing when he shouldn't be. So just things, things like that. Um, so it's hard because there's so many places to send these players to recommend clubs. And I get so many people like I had a call yesterday and, and people today that want to call and say like, where do I go? My club's not doing enough during this, this crisis. It's all zoom sessions. They're not, they're not delivering programs. So I feel like a therapist sometimes on this. So it's tough to, to recommend places. So what I try to do and educate parents on is what the, the goal is. And for, for a male player, the goal is to go pro. So right away, um, I've made more enemies than, than friends in this game because if you don't have a <laughs> European passport, it, it's going to be very tough for you to break into that market because they have 20, 30 players like you already there who are, who are home, home, home uh, grown talent. So what's going to make you stand out there? Now, I try to help kids, and, and my main business is getting them scholarships, but having those honest, honest conversations with them at with what level they are, because I think that's what we have to be. So it's tough to recommend clubs and academies here and, and where to go because, again, um, certain times, certain teams like the OPDL teams here, so our highest tier, can travel and go in and showcase. So it depends on what a player wants. Like if they want a scholarship, there are like, I, I would say like the super clubs that help out with that, but it's hard to break in. So it's very tough. So I, what I try to say is, um, uh, you know, try to recommend clubs and academies that are going to be team focused and individual focused because I think uh, coaches here do a great job at doing team stuff, but forget about the individual and work on tactics and, and formations and, oh, we have to win this game, we have to play this way and, and team stuff and don't do the individual stuff because like Crystal said, we're lucky if a player is going outside and, and playing away from the field or watching watching a game, right? So um, I think it's, 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 it's something I try to help players and, and guide them, but yeah, it's, it's not an easy question. What, what do you think that issue is then, Maria, for them not to go outside? Is, is it influence from parents or is it uh, cultural influences or social media influences? What do you think the issue is for them? Yeah, I, I don't know when it when it started. Like I was I was out. Yeah, I was out. Yeah, definitely, definitely the the internet and stuff doesn't help in Fortnite and the Call of Duty and all this stuff. <laughs> um, but I, I I don't know. Like I just don't think kids are knocking on each other's door and, and going out. Like I think we're we have a lot of introverts now. And you know, I was playing on the street with like you know dads and and whoever wanted to get on the street and play like small small sided games or whatever sport. So. Um, we're, we're hoping to bring that back. But I think also for us, um, we're not playing enough. Like I said, we're only seeing these kids two, three times a week. Um, so maybe six hours if we're, if we're lucky. So I think we should be adding in extra stuff. But again, what, what we have a problem too is, it, you know, it's snowing today here and it's, you know, May 9th. So we're inside a lot of the time and to find space, like we could probably have a separate conversation um, on this. Not only are fee uh, fees expensive here, but try and rent a facility here and get good time and get in uh, <laughs> facilities here. You're looking at like 180 an hour for like a five E five pitch at, at like a prime time. So like a 6 PM start. So um, we, we struggle with, with getting kids on, on pitches. So, and then, then the cities as well, close fields really early here. So, you know, we're already inside come October, but again, being Canadian, we, we are meant for being cold, so I don't know why we're not outside till mid-November and December, so. Yeah, exactly. I, uh, I agree with that for sure. It's just, I don't know. I think, uh, I think players, when I was a kid, just referencing back, I would go to the side of the pitch and uh, watch people play and have my cleats on. I'd be doing keep-ups on the side, and as soon as they would say, they'd look over and like, hey, you want to play? I'm, there's no questions asked. I'm already on there. Done. Oh, yeah, no problem. Go there. Uh, I had a chance where uh, Lewis had come by, uh, did some work here with Storm FC. We played our <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we we played our men's league here. You know what I mean. So uh, Chris was part of that too, and uh, it was fantastic. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think kids. Some of them have it. Some you see it. Some of those you see the passion, the the drive that they want to do it. And some of them. Chris, just... Christos, I remember the the hours after training that we spent myself. Um, myself and yourself, Larissa, Angelo, you know, Angeluch, um, he just, just kicking the balls, just kicking the balls in the goals, just smashing them in, just spending an hour, just, just, uh, having, have, have, 
having competitions, having competitions outside the 18 yard box. You know what I mean? So just yeah, sitting yeah. there and, re- and ready to kick the ball and be like, okay, so now uh, from this area, we're going to hit it. We're going to crossbar challenge um, and, and have that competition. But I don't find that people do that. Not a lot of people are doing that. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to ask me twice. I was there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was there. Um, I, I do have a question for Tom because Tom at the moment is um, is still doing the, the the girls academy, and at the moment with COVID nineteen, you're sort of you, you're working within the um, the end of season reviews. How are you? How are you getting around them? Uh, yeah, so we've got our end of season reviews next week, so that will be done on Zoom. I don't know if other clubs are doing something similar to that. We're going to have about fifteen minutes and just speak to the players and parents over Zoom. But during uh, the lockdown, to be fair, the club has been absolutely fantastic in what they've been delivering. They've delivered live physical sessions for the girls, technical sessions, focusing lots on ball mastery for the foundation phase. They've gave specific technical workouts for them to be getting on at home, physical workouts as well. Um psychologist has been on call pretty much all the time we've been checking in individually and doing team check-ins team meetings every week near enough so we coped with everything going on really well throughout COVID-19 I think probably one of the the best to be fair um (laughs) fair blowing the trumpet but yeah and the reviews next week is going to just be done on zoom so I don't know how well it's going to work, but I suppose it's the best option. You're going to lose that face-to-face value, or is it just going to be a little bit, you know, less nerve-wracking? Because, like I said to Neil last week, I hate, I hate letting players go, and I hate that that face-to-face with mum or dad. You know, where, where you've got to say, you know, little Johnny's going to be let go, and and these are the reasons why. Do you think it's going to be a little bit more easier trying to let these players go? Well, the reviews are going out uh, two days before the meeting so the emotions taken out of it really so you've got the time to sort of understand the decision look what's been wrote and hopefully the emotions and taken out of it so then we can just have a a fair discussion of what needs to be done if you're staying well done you still need to be working on this you've done this really well and if anyone has been released it's these are the reasons why and and hopefully there is no emotion in there. And I think I've never done it this way before. I think it's a it's a great way to to do it like this. Christos, do you do you have that in Canada? Uh, like end of season reviews and, and releasing of players in in AI. Well, currently what we've done is we've done our reviews prior um, from our indoor session. So indoor season was wrapping up. We didn't get to finish the whole indoor season, so we we sent out some I guess midterm reviews uh, for yeah. players on that. Um, and then we're into COVID. But, uh, yeah, going forward, um, the team that we currently have is what we have at the moment. And um, right now, because everything's such an upside down of what's happening, um, we're just – we're hoping to get back onto things, right? So uh, for players and stuff like that, I think they're going to remain in their clubs, academies and stuff like that, and then uh, see what happens with, uh, with the season. You know what I mean? If, it, uh, if we – if we can get back and finish some kind of a season, hopefully maybe, um, that would be great. Uh, if not, then uh, when they lift up the, when they lift it up and they say, for instance, we're not playing this summer and they're like, okay guys, the season's done. Uh, we're going to get back into indoor and we'd have to explore different uh, avenues at that point and uh, go forward, right. To see what we're going to do. Uh, we still keep connection with our teens. Um, Cause I, like I said, for my U uh, 16 girls, um, we keep connection with them through zoom and, and different little uh, exercises and runs that they have to do in the week, as well as with my boys that I coach at uh, storm FC with U 16, same thing. So try and keep that connection going. Um, yeah. um, and make sure that, uh, that everyone's involved in participating as best as they can. I know it's a little bit more difficult when you're doing it online. Um, but having that connection, as long as I find that um, I've talked to some other people and some people have not done anything. Right. So, yeah, I, I understand we're going through difficult times, but keep that keep that connection with uh, with your teams and uh, go forward, right? So, yeah, if players are going to come to an academy or come to our academy afterwards, we'd have to revisit that at that time. Chris, what do you think on that? What do you want your views on that? Uh, most of the – I would say most of the clubs 
um, at least with our uh, the teams. They don't do a ton of the uh, end of season reviews. It's really um, like our seasons have expanded so much. We get into the end of the season ends in September. Um, our tryouts happen almost, or sorry, early September to mid September. Our tryouts happen almost immediately after. So realistically, like once you're above the grassroots level at the U13, our, I find a lot of clubs don't do the end of the season review. They jump straight into, they jump straight into the next tryout. Um, and so everybody comes back and tries to get in there. And then, then if you're not invited back, um, and that's something that we could do a lot better. So with my own teams, I actually do um, season reviews, but I know that's not the norm within our not-for-profit club sectors. Um, it doesn't happen that often, but, um, but with my, with my uh, own nine girls, I definitely do the, the mid-season review. I do an end-of-season review um, to try. And so in August, uh, like last August, I did the end-of-season review and with players and so even before tryouts players already knew um kind of where they were standing and and just in terms of where i saw them through growing so some of them actually at that point um they were making decisions based on whether the kids wanted to continue to practice some kids don't like practicing um and and they have good skill sets and so it's it's all a matter of what what's the individuals here's here's our program here's off how often we're going to train here's where we're going to play um at the grassroots level is, is that something your players even interested in doing? And sometimes moms and dads, when it comes to the travel soccer, uh, will decide, no, you know, that's more intense than I want. I'm going to go look for a program that's maybe once a week. Um, or, or, you know, I guess, and this will be interesting, a good question to ask, especially for the, the group overseas is the, the struggles that I find sometimes is that uh, it's multi-sport. So if you're, you're trying to, to train during the, the winter time, especially like we have a lot of different distractions. We've got kids that are in hockey. We've got kids that play lacrosse and, and soccer and, and how do you mix that up? So my outdoor season tends to have a much better attendance at practice than my indoor, my indoor training. Um, once a week, I'll probably have a good turnout. And then the other, the other two sessions um, I struggle with. So, so it's, it's trying to figure out what you're looking for, um, or what you're, you're, you're almost for each group, at, at least at the club level, you're trying to feel out the parents and what's the interest level um, if, if you're going to be able to have a team. Because if, you, if you're too demanding and your parents are not at that level of demanding, then maybe you don't have – well, then you're not going to have a team. Um, they're going to they're gonna choose to go elsewhere. So at a club level, um, we really almost cater around what the interests of the parents are um, unless you're looking for something more elite. And, and I, we have players that – love practice and they'll come out three, four times a week. They don't have any other uh, outside interests. So, so they'll come out for that amount. Um, or, or if you're not offering that, they'll, they'll do a th their third night a week somewhere else. Um, they might go and work with like a, a, like with coach Maria, or they might go and work with, with a, a local Academy or, or find like a once a week training session that you pay like 200 bucks for, for 10 weeks or something. Um, so it's really, I know I jumped around there a bit, but we don't have uh, the same, at the club level, at least at the smaller clubs, like we're like a mid-sized club, um, you're almost taking pretty much everybody that's coming out most, most times, especially at grassroots. We try not to turn away players at the grassroots. You try and decide, are they target level? Are they development level? Um, target level might train three times a week. Development level, if we have a team at development, um, is once or twice a week. So you try to mirror up and, and find what the good marriage is for the player. But... Um, but I, I really find the indoor, it's almost like you have two, like it really is two different teams is your indoor team and your outdoor, like an outdoor in our club, we have 17 teams this year. will be playing travel soccer, which will actually be a record for our club in one outdoor season. Um, but for indoor, we only have six that are active. They, the other ones are training, but they don't play in the league. So we have six teams that play in the leagues because that's what either the coach is available or, or they have enough interest from players to actually commit to playing on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, and the rest of the time they'll, they'll train like once a week in a, in a turf facility. And then, uh, most of them do try to find that second, um, weeknight in a training facility in the school gym, but, um, it's rare for the team that can do three times a week. So two in a school gym and one on a, on a turf because they, they just can't get the interest level. So I guess, uh, I guess a spinoff question I have is, is how do you, is that the same in Europe? Are you finding that you really struggle to find that you have a season where you struggle to get it? Is there so much more interest in multi-sports? 
um, or just so many other distractions? Or do you have, are you, is it a fairly committed group, especially at the grassroots level? So like Lewis or, or, or Tom or, or um, for Neil, I don't know if that's a question that you guys can answer. Um, yeah, I think we, in terms of, obviously we don't have your, your indoor and outdoor comparisons to you guys, but um, certainly within our academy environment, I think we mentioned this briefly before, is that, yeah, these, the parameters and the, the expectations are set out at the very start of each season for us. So um, attendance is very much at, at the forefront and um, it's impressed upon our players that if, if attendance is low, then you're not going to succeed and, and you're not going to be within, get as much playing time as you're expecting if, if you're not getting as much training time. So, um, yeah, we find that generally our attendance is, is really, really good. Um, it, it helps that, in terms of your multi-sport stuff, it helps that come the summer, that's when we have our break, the lads can start to play other sports, particularly cricket in England, so that the cricket season starts, so they can have a little bit of time away from, from, from football and, and then play bits of cricket before they come back and join in with all, which I think is important as well. Um, throughout the season, they've still got their, their school stuff as well, so the extra curricular stuff for school, whether it be rugby, whether it be athletics, cross-country and things like that. But again, it's all encouraged alongside their football but it doesn't affect certainly our academy stuff so it doesn't affect our um uh attendance levels so i don't know how lewis and, and tom are a little bit slightly different maybe i don't know um i'll answer quite hopefully quite quickly and quite briefly but what i experienced at a sort of lower regional level within wales um at a schools schools um level um we would sort of encourage that multi multi-sports approach um, I, the, whole, the whole reason was just because it sort of creates that more resilient and effective player because they learn different skills doing different types of sports. Um, there was a there was a few lads playing rugby, um, where who were playing for us at the same time. So we just sort of allowed that and encouraged that. Um, there was a, a young lad doing um, judo or ju jujitsu uh, competitions, and we were like, yeah, hey, you go and do that as well. You know, we'll 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 kind of still be here. Um, but like you just said, Neil, maybe at, at the at the professional level, um, there's you know there's football, and then once football's done, there's then you can do your sort of your 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 other activities. Um, but I think a multi 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 sports approach is is a good approach. I think I've, I've read a lot of our articles recently because I'm doing a, a module on curriculum design and how you design your curriculum um, through 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 different psychologies and different uh, periodization models and stuff. Um, and they're just kind of saying that that multi-sports approach it, it creates a more resilient player. Yeah, we've, uh, Lewis, we've, it's, we've introduced, it's not a regular uh, part of our curriculum, but our foundation has certainly done extra sports. They do basketball now and again. They've got a martial arts section to each, each, each phase. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at Manchester United's model uh, for yeah. their hybrid and their, um, their full-time lads in their academy. And they have structured uh, different sports within their timetable. So with every week they'll have, they'll have a, a different ball sport within their, within their curriculum. They'll have a martial arts section. They'll have a specific, certainly the younger end, uh, because it helps with sort of motor skills and and, yeah. and agility and, yeah. and, and uh, coordination and all sorts like that. So that's built. That's a big part of Manchester Man Manchester United's uh, philosophy on their and their foundation, their their YDP as well, um, which is which is really really intriguing. It has to be there, um, but for Chris, as, as Chris was saying before, it's it's whether that alongside it affects your attendance, isn't it? Really, it's, yeah. uh, it wants to be encouraged, but. It also doesn't want to affect their football as well in 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 a, in a similar sort of way. Uh, it's, it's getting that balance, I think. We've been at Villa having so when the the girls go and have their uh, physical training uh, with the head of physical, um, they sometimes do a lot of different multi sports. So they do they've done bits on rugby. Uh, they've done other bits of handball, and I think linking it back to Lou and doing his research, I think it's about is it three sports you need to be doing, really to help become a professional uh, athlete or professional footballer. If I'm right, I don't know if you remember that, Lou. No, not too sure. No. <laughs> Can't back you up there. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, that was a test. That was. <laughs> it was a test that I failed. But, um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's it's meant to be three sports that if you work on that it gives you a better chance of becoming more of a professional and a more rounded player. Um, 
But, you know, when kids come up to us saying that they've got different competitions, you know, we'll, we'll never hold them back. Kids go and do that. I think it's really important for them to go and do it. But it's equally as important that if they do want to do football professionally or take it as far as they can, that they, they don't jeopardise their own chances and are taking the football seriously still as well. But they are enjoying it, their football. But that's that's what we do. So they, they do go and have uh, some some of the multi-sports within our, within our sessions at Villa. Neil, in regards to um, making let's say making changes within your academy, either either at PDP phase, YDP, or, or foundation phase, how would you make your decisions when you're changing? Um, would you make them based off I don't know governing body advice, or do you make the decisions based off research and uh, and, uh, and 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 scholar uh, scholarly uh, articles and researchers? How would you do that, or would you just make it based on your opinion? I think generally mostly based on opinion. I think it, it, it's it's down to players' needs. So if we think, um, for example, we're looking at, at, at players within our foundation phase. If we are looking at listen, we've got some players when they when they're having growth spurts, they're really struggling with with moving their, their limbs and and coordination. And, and as, as you well get at, at various ages, then we have look look at solutions. So what are the solutions to that? Do they have specific strength and conditioning work, agility work, ladder base work, or do we incorporate different sports within to move different ways and, and help them with with their, with their coordination level? So we have we we do loads of little different things. We have our foundation league just left now, but he was fantastic at getting different things out of the out of different sessions. So they'd have he'd set up little obstacle courses for the players and. Um, different ways of dodging balls. They play dodgeball now and again. They, they they've got futsal going on. They've got martial arts. They've got all sorts of little different things that he'd incorporate now and again. I think one of the main things he was getting at it was not just variety of of curriculum to keep boys interested and keep boys alive, but variety for different types of movement patterns and 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 for them to solve problems in a different way as well. So from a tactical and, and psychological point of view, mm. it, it's really good. So if you solve problems in different types of sports and, and you move in different ways in different types of sports, and that will transfer over to your football. And we found that, certainly in our experience, so again, you go off experience, not just opinion. In our experience, it, it, it's helped the players in, in loads of different ways. But certainly we, we prefer that at a lower level, a younger level, so uh, eight, eight, eight to twelves, and then and then there on that's when you're sort of concentrating more on, on football and, and embedding those sort of principles into them after that. But I think foundation is definitely multi sports orientated if it, within the curriculum more and more across across Britain I would say. Guys, you mentioned funding earlier um, a little bit in terms of, of especially, I think, Lewis, you, you touched upon it a little bit about funding coming in. We, yep. we don't have a lot when it comes to, I mean, obviously, like uh, any for-profit um, academies and whatnot don't, don't have access to government funding, even at the club level, unless you have a project um, such as you're, you're working on facility or whatnot. Um, there's not a lot of government funding in Ontario, which maybe. So it's partly drives up some of the costs, but what are the what does the government do um, from a funding perspective in the UK to help out uh, the clubs and whatnot, or do they? Um, well, our funding comes down from the Premier League, okay. so uh, the Premier League sets up sort of the E Triple B, um, where it's your your funding is graded based on your category level, so. The more money you pump into your academy, the more you'll get back from the Premier League. So the Cat Ones will pump more money in in terms of facilities and, 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 and levels of coaching and what have you, uh, more staff in. And then that, that funding will get matched by, by the Premier League with their funding. And, and the same goes for sort of the lower academies down. Um, but as Lewis mentioned earlier on, there's certain specifics that you have to have. So... Um, you get uh, legislated all the time by by the EFL and, and and the Premier League as to what you are delivering, how you are delivering it, um, and to what level uh, in terms of whether you continue to get your funding. So you have to have certain levels in order to get that funding, but it comes it does come down from from the Premier League football league. You get you get validated every three years, isn't it? They they come and oh god, mate, it. it's 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 more complicated. That's different. Oh, so is now, it? 
have yeah you have your audit so your audit yeah. your full football audit is every three years yeah that's yeah that's, yeah but within that so if you have your audit your full football audit one year the next year you can have your safeguarding audit or <laughs> the next year after that you have your um your base your base level um, compliance audit and, yeah and then, then your full, full your full audit will, will come. The full football audit will come the year after. So you're almost always getting audited and and checked upon. So which is good. So it, it checks upon where the money's going and and how it's being distributed at the football club and within the academy. So I I, I do agree with you. I, I feel it's it's good to be audited because it keeps everyone on souls, keeps you doing things right. Yes. And and, and yeah. validates validates the funding that you're getting as well, which is which is really good. Yeah. Um, I think I think from my experience um, with, with the ladies and the, and the sort of the, the amateur semi pro level that, that we're at at the moment, um, our funding comes from the FAW and the FAW Trust, um, and, we, and we get um, a small pot of funding per year. Now I, I sort of found out in a meeting with the FAW um, in the last few months that um, the the governing body of Europe, the UEFA, they send a pot or they give a pot to the FAW, then that pot then gets split in many different avenues to go many different ways now i found out that the men have their own pot uh which is quite a large pot for funding females in, in wales have a smaller pot and it's based on community um and then females on top so when they when they kind of put that information to myself i just kind of just my jaw fell to the floor and i thought men are getting all this money and then females are getting that much money on top of community funding and i was just a bit like it's, it's crazy how underfunded female football is um, in Wales. It's like, it, it, I don't know what can be done. You've got to, you've got to convince the, the high brass guys at the top that, that females deserve more money, uh, to, you know, that we deserve more money to, to build the game here. I, I don't know what we can do um, in, in regards to that. I guess it's perceptions, Lewis, isn't it? The perception of how popular the men's game is. Yeah. Is, is the perception of how much money to put into it in order to get money out of it. Yeah. So funding will be based always in anything, in any walk of life, in any, any sort of business. It's always based on whatever funding or money you put into something is what you can expect to get out of it at the end of it. And unfortunately, the, minute, the men's game is, is a lot bigger than the women's game. So that is why it is at the moment. I mean, we, we were talking recently, Christos, weren't we, about the emergence of the women's game over here. Um, and who, yeah, knows, who knows what it looked like in, in two to three years' time. I, it, it, is, it is growing all the time. And, and you, I'm not saying that the, the level of funding or, or the money going into the women's game will get as much as the men, because I can't see that ever happening over here. But I think the, the gap will start to close, I think, over the next oh, yeah. two or three years. I think, I think uh, in my opinion, um, yeah, I get it. I, I see that the, the, the men's soccer, yeah, they're getting millions and, and and the women's soccer, they're not getting nearly as much. But what they should do is make it a ratio in terms of what you're going to be paying. You know what I mean? So don't – like women's soccer is is next to next to nothing what they get, right? So it's not fair for them. You know what I mean? They're competing and stuff like that. But does it have to be 2020 now and, and now we're making changes? Like why didn't this happen earlier? You know what I mean? So there's so many, there's so many unanswered questions there that – um, give a ratio depending on where you are and what you're playing, what level of soccer you're playing. You should be compensated for that, hundred percent. It doesn't matter if uh, it's men or women. Okay, if you want to give more to men and, and, and a little bit less than women, uh, whatever, whatever you decide, that's your choice. But if you look at the the ratio in terms of what an, an average female footballer gets paid versus a, a male, it's not even close. You know what I mean? I'm talking at a professional level, right? Yeah, I, th I think from a far point of view, go on, Neil. I think what you've also got, Lewis, you'll know this as well, is that yeah. the, the game in, in, in England, Wales and, and Scotland is so broad in terms of the amount of professionals. It's, it's not like anywhere else in Europe. So in, in no. Germany, top two leagues. In, in, in England, you've got, you've got the top four. You've got the National League now that is a lot of full-time uh, teams playing in there. You've got even the National League North and South now. And professional teams in there, so you're talking upward of, you're talking over a hundred professional football teams just in England, and and I think that transfer that to the women's game now, where again, correct me if I'm wrong on this one, Lewis, but I would say there's fewer than twenty, is there, professional teams? Probably, yeah, 
Yeah, I think I think it's just a I think it's just a top tier, isn't it, of of, Eng, of English English women's football. I think that's that's it. There's yeah. none in Wales. Um, yeah. maybe no. I was going to say Cardiff Met, but Cardiff Met are funded through through the university and um, and that sort of that sort of avenue. So. Um, I think I think from our point of view, with the with the female game, it's there. Are, there are teams within the the top tier of women's football that are in a higher position than the men's team equivalent. So um, one of them's I think it's Britain Ferry. So Britain Ferry men's are in a lower league than Britain Ferry women's, but Britain Ferry men's get more funding, more money, uh, and then the women are obviously in a higher league, so they, they're getting a little bit confused in that that yeah. sort of that gap. And um, why is there so little funding for us when we're here and the men are here. So I think that's the that's the small issue. But again, I, I agree with what you said. It's it's how big the men's game is, how big the women's game is. But it's just how we get the women's game higher. It's a, it's a structure. It's a, it comes yeah. down to structure. Okay, because what happens is um, when you have the men's soccer has been going on forever. Okay, uh, in my opinion, for women's soccer, you got to make it enticing. You got to make it inviting. You got to make it work worth for something. You know what I mean? So um, players that are going to put in the work, the time to develop, to get to the next level of, of, of soccer, um, reward them. You know what I mean? So don't be like, I just think that it will wait. Like it's good that we're making changes, uh, but I think they should have done this a while back because the rewards that I remember, if I can remember, I don't know, Chris, I don't know, 15 years ago when female soccer was playing, it was <laughs> – wasn't huge right so uh, some of them most of them then some of them would be playing professional soccer so they're a professional athlete and they'd be working a, a full-time job you know what I mean so um, I think the structure should have been worked on back but going forward make it enticing for them you know what I mean and I think that the words getting around uh, globally um, people are coming on board and really um, trying to help out the, the women's soccer and, and and get the funding that they, they that they need for um, professional status. You know what I mean. And then work from there. So pay your professionals, get them at that hierarchy. You know what I mean. And then work your way down and and create a system where they've already done that for the, for the men's soccer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, guys, um, I had a another another quick question. I actually, I have a question for Tom. Um, so what what age group uh, women's do you coach right now? Yeah. Uh, I was, this season I was with the under twelves. Okay, and then this is the like the, your the elite for for Aston Villa, correct? Uh, yeah, for the women's, yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, the pathway that they go from um, there, where would these girls go next? Like, um, what would be their what would be their pathway for for these ladies here? Because they're playing at an elite level, or and they're developing at an elite level. Where do they go next? Yeah. So so far, uh, well, right now we've got under tens, under twelves, fourteen, sixteens, and in the first team. But we're now beginning the transition of there's going to be like an academy program for under eighteens, where they do uh, they have a one day release program a week, um, I believe, and then. That will be like a sort of a, a development team, and that will be the the top pathway to getting into the uh, the first team. We're also having like meetings with around grassroots players with uh, how we can sort of mentor and help grassroots clubs, but also be like a, a way of recruiting players as well. So that's sort of just a quick overview of uh, what the little pathway we're getting towards at the moment cool cool and then uh i have a question again for uh, for you maria um since you you're involved with the ncaa and um uh, colleges and, and recruiting and stuff like that where what is, what's your opinion in players going ncaa division one two possibly three or naia or um uh, here in canada soccer like uh, uh universities and colleges yeah, so I think if you asked me this question a year and a half ago, I would say all NC all NCAA. It was all I was really focusing on until I had a player actually. Um, so it was the first player. So I had four recruiting classes go over and play in the states. Um, I had one girl 
um, have a red shirt year, finish school. So she had one year left and said, Hey, can you help me come back? She was a Canadian. Can you come back and, and play in Canada? So I got her into York uh, this year. She was the starting goalie with York. They won the national championship. And it was the first time I've really, I've seen the OUA um, and I've seen soccer in Canada at the university level. And I've seen it before, but really dive deep because of her and learn through her experiences. So I've just started researching and, and learning more about the OUA, um, expanding my network here, and then the OCAA. So I think for, for me, I'm, I, I want players to, to make those decisions. But here, like for the OCAA, you have two seasons. So for, for a player who wants to develop, you have an indoor and an outdoor season. So you have your fall and your winter. You have your 11 v 11 and then your 6 v 6 when the NCAA doesn't have that, they have a little bit of a spring season, but there's a lot of rules around that. And then the OUA doesn't have that. So for someone who wants to develop in playing, the OCAA is a good level to start. The OUA is very competitive. There's scholarship money to give out. So for, for a player, I mean, uh, look at all avenues. The space is very expensive to go. And um, I think now we'll be, for athletes here in Canada, if they're not getting ahead of their recruiting earlier, they're going to struggle because American coaches are now going into Europe to find players more than they ever have. Um, at the NCAA Division One level, I know coaches are spending their time, so their recruiting days where they can leave campus and fly into Europe to find players and setting up with clubs and academies there and, and recruiters there to get players over because the game there, especially on the women's side, is growing very fast where we've kind of just kind of, you know, stayed in, in coast mode. Um, so I think players will struggle now competing against European players when before the drive was, if you want an international, come to Canada. So it's not just at the NCAA Division One level, it's Division Two. NINAs are going to go get those uh, players in Europe. So And players in Europe want to come over and get a scholarship in America as well. So I think um, for, for a Canadian player, look at both options. And I wasn't telling players that before, and now I really am, is to keep both options open. And in order for me to work with a player, they need to be open to both because um, the scholarship money is sometimes isn't there as, as it used to be, you know, even a year and a half ago with a Canadian player. So I'm, I'm a fan of both now and not just even in Ontario. I mean, I've connected with coaches out in Vancouver, Alberta, Winnipeg. Why not go see some of Canada as well and play? Yeah, exactly. I, uh, um, in my in my opinion, I think that's a great idea. The more options, the better, right? So, um, there's players that are going to go and, and w would like to go into Division three or Division two. Then that's that's no problem. But if you, I believe, um, you have options. You know, what I mean, if there's options laid out in front of you and you can go somewhere, why not? You know, what I mean, it's mm. not just regimented to one area. It's uh, you can uh, you can you can go play. Uh, university level or you can go into the state so I think it's fantastic and uh, again um, there's there's not a lot of people that do that so coach Marie again uh, excellent work uh, I, I love what you do man it's fantastic you're really connecting with these players uh, and, and the development is, is, is awesome and so um, I believe that's what a coach should do that's that's my opinion a coach should be developing players you develop players the best you can next players that come in guess what you start up you look at the strengths and weaknesses and say guess okay we're good. We can start here. This is our starting point. Let's work on develop them. Away they go. Next, next. And just keep going. It's not, it's not, uh, this is my team. Uh, we're going to win championships and stuff like that. Championships and stuff like that happen, man. They, they, they come, right? So, hey, don't, be, don't be set in your way in terms of just winning. When you win, it's great. Fantastic. I love it. When, when you don't win, you don't win. You look at where you can develop from there. So I just think sometimes yeah. clubs, I think clubs and academies, uh, sometimes some coaches in their mindset is just uh, – I don't, I don't see, I don't think they see that. Yeah. And I think like, like we we're different than, than Europe, Europe, you have the players that are willing to work results. You want to get results here. We don't need results. What is Ontario cup? What is winning PISL? What, what does that mean? So I tell my kids, we're going to lose more than we win. And parents don't like that, but it's true because we're going to develop. I'm not a joystick coach at all. I barely speak. So I want kids to make mistakes because can, when you put on a resume, I've won Ontario cup. No one really knows what that means. So for me, I want to be able to get players developed in order to have the conversation for them to play, you know, collegiate soccer, not even play at the next level. Maybe, you know, they become a coach or they become an administrator at a club. They stay exactly. involved in the game somehow because only a small percentage go on to play at that next level. But you've given up maybe 15 years of playing your youth career 
So giving back. And I think also in my training and when I work with players, I want my older players to be role models for the younger. So most of my older athletes, um, so anywhere from 15 to 18, their fees are redu like reduced in our training program because they help coach the younger kids. Um, even in, in our warm up at some of our locations, the younger kids are warming up with the older kids. So I try to create that, that model so that way the younger kids always see the older kids and, and we go from there. So yeah, I think it's, it's all about giving back. And, and I think for the older kids, it's nice for them to feel like, you know, they're doing something to inspire, you know, uh, U8 or U9 player. 100%. I, and that's a key thing. It's what, what, like I've told the girls too, uh, for our U16 girls team, I said, like, what's your goals? Where do you want to go? You know what I mean? Like, don't, like, I know the big picture is I'm going to go play college. I want to go play this. That's fine. It's fantastic. It's good. It's a goal. But have you thought of maybe like, what do you, how, how's your schooling? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm doing, uh, I want to be a physiotherapist. Perfect. So get into physiotherapy. You know what I mean? Get the connections, keep playing your soccer, maybe play at a college level or university level, but continue with your, with your schooling in terms of physiotherapy. You can get into a team. You can be a physiotherapist for a team, for, for, uh, for a club. You know what I mean? Um, uh, Come down and coach uh, for Ontario soccer. And, uh, I'm currently just finishing up uh, our, my uh, technical director's course. And the first thing we did when we walked in there were well, all these technical directors are across Ontario for their clubs and, or, uh, or academy. And we're just sitting there and guess what? There's not even one, one female in that course, not even one. So I'm like, I tell these girls all the time, like, you know what? Come back and coach. You know what I mean, uh, I love it. You know what I mean? Um, if, if you love that passion, Come do it at a younger level. Do refereeing, stuff like that. I, I think that we got to promote it and push it because going at a technical director level and looking at it and looking at that course and then not even having one female in there, I was just like, even Gary Miller, uh, the technical director for Ontario Soccer Game, is like, what's the problem in here, guys? And we're just like, we're looking around and we're like, at first we didn't, to be honest, at first we didn't see it. I'm just like, uh, I don't know what the problem is. Uh, and they're like, there's no female athlete, there's no female coaches in here. And I'm like, exactly. It's, it's a very good point, right? So... Going back to what you were saying, Maria, uh, and fantastic having those players mentor the smaller ones, right? So um, me coaching right now, I get mentored from Ontario soccer, from people that uh, have uh, higher education. Uh, Neil, when you came and ran some camps, fantastic work. You know what I mean? That, I, I see you as a mentor, you know what I mean? And uh, taking things like that, the communication stuff that we're doing right now and, and, and having that connection is massive. So why can't we just make sure that we pass it on to our, our, our younger athletes and continue with the young? Because um, the more that everyone works together and becomes receptive, the bigger the product is, you know what I mean? The bigger of the success. Is. So you, you have that continuity, don't you, as well, with throughout what you're doing. And uh, it's a great point, Maria, because we, we do the same with, um, with our academy boys. So our, our scholars uh, are under 18s. I, I have them on rota. So uh, two scholars will... Uh, be down at an academy night every week. So our academy nights go from uh, sort of half four till, till nine o'clock. So two of our academy scholars are down there from half four till nine. Now, some of them might be joining in with taking sessions. Some might just be helping out with the equipment. Uh, it's a good grounding for them, but it's also, it's great for the younger boys. Uh, they look up to these players. That's, this is where they want to be. And it, it, I think it helps in, 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 in a learning process from both perspectives. The, the under nines will, will, will look up to these boys and, and look at what they're doing and take what, from what they're doing. Whereas the, uh, the under 18s, the scholars, will then see how we coach within different environments with different types of players, but essentially try and get the same messages across just in different ways, obviously with different level age players. So I think it works really, really well. And it's great that you do that because it is... Uh, it's fantastic. It gives you continuity. And it, 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 as you say, as Christoph says, it gives back as well that, that, uh, that knowledge that's been transferred to those older players. And, and they, they feel validated as well by passing yeah. that information on as well. And they don't moan about it. They're, they're, they definitely just need more information. Some of them are shy or in, in, introverted and, and don't want to do it. But once they get going, you know, they love it. So it's just telling them like, you know, players, you know, are looking up to you and you're a role model in the community. So why not do this? And they, and they love that. And, you know, they have good attendance, they're showing up, they're helping out and they're learning as well. So I think that's, that's so important and uh, we should be doing it more. And um, I'm hoping clubs and, and academies who listen to this will start to see, you know, you ask the older players because here in, in Ontario, 
older players in high school have to get volunteer hours in order to graduate. So why not get your hours while volunteering in a sport that you play three, four nights a week? Sounds perfect. I mean, when I, when I first came up with the idea and, and, and put it to my under 18s, there was a bit of a groan. <laughs> oh, we have to be at, uh, at the academy training nights. Every single one of them, when they came down in, in the little groups of two, which I picked, I didn't want friends going down together within the group or social <laughs> groups. Just listen, I'm picking that number and that number, you're coming down. And they've all embraced it. They've all took it on board. And, and more often than not, they've, they've really enjoyed the full night. And it is a long night. So um, they've, they've all taken it, especially because we have a lot of players who are in, in digs away from families. And, and sometimes it can just, it, it can give them something to do with the night as well. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's worked really well, which is something I'll definitely do sort of in the coming season as well. Well, guys, you know what? We've been, uh, we've been talking for uh, for, for a while now, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like a, a special thank you to Maria, Neil, Tom, Lewis, and uh, Chris for coming on. Um, we're, this is something that we do weekly, and we're just, you know what I mean, we bring in special guests. Uh, you guys want to come back on, by all means, you know what I mean, we'll come back yep. and uh, have some soccer talk, man. You know, it's, uh, I, I love it. Um, the, the reason why we we started doing something like this, I'll tell you guys, is uh, we used to <laughs> – Lewis is probably going to laugh at this, but exactly right after soccer, we'd be talking for hours. I'd be getting phone calls on my, from my wife going, hey, uh, are you coming home? Or, uh, <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving in five minutes. And that five minutes would be half an hour and 40 minutes. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm trusting I'm coming. But uh, again, a special thank you to all you guys for, uh, for coming today and, uh, and, and having this session. So um, I really appreciate all the knowledge and stuff uh, that we shared uh, uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting here, and uh, um, I can't wait uh, to have more. So, uh, other than that, if there's anything else anyone wants to say, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your days. Uh, well, I'll go out and shovel some snow, but uh, we're <laughs> all as well. Okay, so uh, take care from me, and uh, thanks again, everyone. See you thanks, later. Guys. Take care, thanks, guys. Take it easy. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, bye.